Thank you, Rachel and Noel. I'm Frampton Tolbert, a member of the MAS Preservation Committee. A rare quality of successful cities is that they manage to feel both timeless and unpredictable. But when the characteristic churn of new residents comes into conflict with established communities, how do you balance that change? In the next series of discussions, we'll unpack the concept of displacement. We'll also examine the rise of new mechanisms like community land trusts that seek to protect neighborhoods from individual, cultural, and commercial destabilization. And later we'll hear from a collective of urban planners called Black Space, who are leading an effort to protect historically black neighborhoods and cultural assets. To begin, please welcome moderator Arun Venegopal. And welcome to the Combating Displacement panel. Uh, let me introduce my panelists here. To my left is Robert Ogilvie. He is the Oakland Director at SPUR, stands for, I don't know if you use the expanded version, but it's the San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association, or is that like an antiquated thing? It's like, no, it's like good. That's AFC good. or something? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, previously, Robert was Vice President for Strategic Engagement at Change Lab as, uh, Solutions. He served as a faculty member in the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of California in Berkeley, and he's a consultant to many city and county governments and nonprofits. And he also went to Columbia, am I right? Correct. Okay. And to his left is James D. Philippus. Uh, he's a professor of urban planning at Rutgers, and he has a focus on issues spanning community organizing and development, as well as urban policy and affordable housing. He's written extensively about CLTs, community land trusts, which we'll talk about, and how they may be developed and deployed to optimize neighborhood, city, and collective transformation. Please welcome our panelists. All right, so let's start broadly here. We're talking about combating displacement. Let's just set the term here. What exactly is displacement? Why do you think we care about it right now? Um, well, I mean, normally when we talk about displacement, we're talking about an involuntary move, right? This is not people making a decision that, that they want to relocate for life or employment reasons, but, but you know, have to meet, relocate because either their building has suffered enough disinvestment and decline that it's become almost unlivable to them or unlivable sort of full stop, um, or conversely, the other side of the same coin is um, rents go up dramatically and they can no longer afford the price of rent. Um, there's a whole sort of universe of indirect displacement which gets you know, a little bit fuzzy and the boundaries between voluntary and involuntary are maybe not completely like, hard and fast um, in terms of the moves um, that, that people make. But, um, but broadly speaking, when we're talking about displacement, we're talking about involuntary movement, people being forced out of their homes. So is this a perennial problem, or is this something, is this something that we're only paying attention to now, or is it actually getting worse now? Well, go ahead, In um, some places, it's definitely gotten worse. In some places, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and in places that have strong economies, in places that well-educated, uh, well-to-do job seekers are moving to, mm -hmm. uh, places in which the housing supply production is not keeping up with the new demand, mm -hmm. it's definitely a problem. But there are many American cities where it isn't a problem because those criteria, those conditions that I just described don't apply. Right. So, uh, well, go ahead, James. Um, I mean, we've obviously had displacement in the past, right? I mean, we... We're, I mean, we all remember the period of urban renewal after World War II and all of the forced um, movement of people that that entailed, um, you know, whether it be kind of eminent domain for, for roads or just, uh, you know, performing arts center on the Upper West Side or whatever. Um, you know, so we've done it before. What makes our current period a little bit different is that the public sector is only indirectly yeah. part of the process. 
um, and it's a, a set of processes driven primarily by private sector actors, whereas in the post-World War II period, it was driven overwhelmingly by the public sector. So something I heard a lot during the Bloomberg years was that displacement is a good problem for a city to have. In a sense, it validates the, the attractiveness of the city and that if you're gonna have problems, it's one of the ones you prefer to have. What do you make of that? Um, that is not factually incorrect. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> how, how's that? Um, uh, uh, but Michael Bloomberg could afford to say that. That is not factually incorrect either. Um, so yes, but it's still a problem. Uh, you know, it, it, it's still a problem. And it's one that we're here to, tr you know, we at Spur are trying to figure out how to deal with. Uh, it is a problem for the people who are being displaced. It is a problem for the city in which the displacement happens because so often the people who are being displaced um, play such an integral role in the fabric of the city, in the economy of the city. Um, where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the segments of population being displaced include almost everybody who uh, does not happen to have worked for a tech startup that has gone public or been bought by Google. Right. Um, and I'm not exaggerating that at all. So it's teachers, it's police, it's the, the, the whole sort of fabric of our society. And so for them, if you ask them if that's a good problem, a problem that the city should be happy to have, I think you'll get a different answer. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. um, I would also add, though, that that still is, I mean, we're now 10 years since the onset of the foreclosure crisis. And if you were to walk around the central ward of Newark um, now, you know, or quite frankly, go to southeastern Queens, um, in, in, in our uh, city here, you know, you still see, you know, private sector displacement that's not about gentrification, but is about predatory lending, driving people out of home. And so, you know, the displacement that Bloomberg was talking about and that, and that Robert was, was sort of referring to is, is, you know, the one that we talk about most often, um, but it is not the sum total of displacement in our time. Like, you know, we, we did go through a very aggressive displacement of, pe of low-income people um, not that long ago. Now, Robert, you have, I think, what might qualify as a pet peeve, which is that a lot of people use the terms displacement and gentrification interchangeably. Which they are not, yeah. Um, example I will give right now, uh, gentrification is not necessarily displacement. Often it is, but it doesn't have to be if there is a mechanism to keep those in place who want to stay in place, so renter protection, certain things like that, and if the market is providing new supply in the neighborhoods where the demand is increasing, uh, then gentrification doesn't have to equal displacement. About, I don't know, 15 years ago, I had a class that worked for a couple of semesters in San Jose. They were doing a neighborhood revitalization initiative, and we heard from all the planners about what they wanted to accomplish, and then we decided to ask the residents what they wanted to see in the neighborhood as a result of the revitalization initiative. And one woman, I'll never forget, said, what I really want to see is I want to see Domino's start delivering in my neighborhood again. <laughs> um, because Domino's wouldn't come for a variety of reasons, including safety. Now, Domino's moving into the neighborhood again is a clear sign of gentrification. Um, but that's exactly what the woman wanted in the neighborhood. Now, she also wanted to be able to stay in her neighborhood to be able to enjoy the benefits of gentrification. So to me, that's the difference between gentrification and displacement, right. if someone like her is able to stay. Right. Sure. I mean, I know that in my own corner of Queens, when Starbucks landed up, it was like the apocalypse for some people. It was like, oh no, this is at the end of, you know, the beginning of the end or whatever. How was it for other people? You know, there are a lot of people, I must say, it's probably one of the most diverse gathering places at that uh, in the neighborhood mm -hmm. is that particular Starbucks. I mean, I, I would say, um, and I'm not sure uh, that we need to, to debate uh, the, you know, sort of the semantics of gentrification because that isn't that helpful, and I'm an academic, and I have seen enough semantic debates. Um, the bigger question for me is, as someone who wants our, our neighborhoods and our cities to, to be more equitable, is what are the logics that inform 
how neighborhoods and communities change and what are the values, you know. Uh, I mean, anti-gentrification should never be about sort of embracing the status quo when the status quo is so clearly not good enough. Um, in so many different ways. And so to me, uh, you know, displacement is, is a real story. Um, whether or not we label it as, gen you know, sort of as part, inherently part of gentrification or not, I, I don't really, it, it doesn't necessarily matter too much. I want to see neighborhoods be better for the people that live within them and neighborhoods change in ways that improve housing and working conditions for low-income folks and, and not have that, those changes result in them being forced to leave. Yeah. James, are, are there cities that you think have, relatively speaking, figured it out? Um, yeah, relatively speaking, um, right? Uh, oh, no. Who's who, better? Who's better? Well, there. Are, I mean, I mean, I take Robert's point and 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 Mike Bloomberg's point um, that that we sort of referred to earlier. That on some level, all of the cities that are sort of that have had booming economies in, in the 21st century are dealing with you know, these forces, right? And, and that the cities that tend not to be dealing with um, displacement um, from neighborhood improvements are the cities that, quite frankly, are still struggling with population loss, right? Um, and so, but among the cities that have seen a significant growth in their economy and, and a fairly robust economy, um, you know, you could put a pretty, good contrast between how it's playing out in a city like, say, Denver, compared to how it's playing out in, in Minneapolis, right? Where, where, you know, as two sort of second tier cities, and I'm a native New Yorker, and I still live in New York, and so anything that's not here is a second tier city. Um, but, um, but <laughs> sorry, Robert, Talk I love the Bay Area. Talk about pandering to your audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine, um, fine. You know, but, but, but a city like Minneapolis has, has in, in general been more successful at, at, at dealing with these issues, both by fairly aggressive um, you know, regional planning efforts by the Metropolitan uh, Planning Council there, um, and, and a, a, a pretty aggressive effort to have fair housing in the suburbs, but then also a set of forms of permanently affordable housing within um, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul um, that are larger and more robust than, than in most other places. I'll give you one more. Seattle, um, for those of you who haven't been there recently, I got to spend a week there in May. And the former, now former mayor um, led a multi-year process, the HALA, H-A-L-A, Housing Affordability Livability Assessment, um, I think is what the final A was. Um, and they have what they will describe as a social license to grow. Uh, people are not entirely, because you'll never get entire, um, but largely supportive of a growth agenda there that they have had input into shaping that they feel is growing for them and not over them or to them. Uh, and so Seattle, uh, in the Bay Area, we talk about Seattle a lot because the population is halfway between Oakland's 400,000 and San Francisco's 800,000. And they're adding about 10,000 housing units a year, uh, which is really big for a 600,000 city. Mm -hmm. Amazon, which used to be headquartered in a nondescript suburban office park, has moved right downtown to a new neighborhood that's just north of downtown. They have moved 30,000 employees into an urban campus and a quarter of those folks walk to work. Um, in Seattle, that is considered to be genuinely a good thing. Um, and there are parts of town which were decrepit, which have really come to life. Um, and working together with uh, a number of community benefit corporations, community development corporations, a city agency, uh, it's not perfect, um, but things are being spread around and the displacement pressures there are lower than they are where I am. So I was going to go to a question from the audience, but since you brought up Amazon, is there any way for a city that's, tr that's trying to court Amazon right now oh boy. To, be, um, to not be pro-displacement by doing that? So um, the mayor of Oakland asked us to help with um, Oakland's bid to get Amazon to come, and we responded that we thought that was a waste of time, and she said, that's why I want you to do it, um, <laughs> and not the city. Um, but, but um, so the Bay Area is putting forth two regional bids. 
There will be no tax cuts. There will be none of those sorts of things. Um, and what we're saying is everyone else is headquartered here. They're headquartered here for a reason. We've got the talent. We have the sort of urban fabric that you like. It will be a smart decision to come here. Right. Whether that works or not, we'll soon find out. Right. Um, but I think that uh, it is, that, that's the approach. Right. We're James, taking. can you imagine being a, a community activist and one, a pro anti-displacement activist in any city and welcoming Amazon? Um, I mean, I think it really depends on the city. Um, I mean, I, you know, again, I mean, you could take, I mean, quite frankly, you know, Cleveland is at what? 375,000 people now? And Cleveland was at 1.1 million, you know, in, in the, in the post-war period. Um, I mean, 375,000, I mean, you have more people living on a seven train. Um, and I'm not, I, I, that's actually empirically true. That's, that's, that's not, I mean, just in Queens, right? Just from LIC to Flushing. Um, and, you know, I don't, I would not be that concerned about displacement in a context like that. Um, I, you know, it, Amazon shows up with, you know, in, in Brooklyn, where I've been living my entire adult life, um, and um, with 50,000 new employees, it's hard to see how the housing stock sort of absorbs, you know, that without there being very significant displacement pressures. Um, so I, I mean, I, you know, some of that is very context dependent, which I know is a cop out, but it, uh, I don't think I, it actually is a cop out here. All right, so this is a question from Lynn Kelly in the audience. Um, here's a question. Improved open space is now feared by communities as causing displacement. Uh -huh. How do we make parks be viewed as critical city infrastructure and not an amenity? You know, what happened in Seattle and what I saw happen many years ago in Long Beach with bike lanes um, taught me that involving community in the planning process so that open space amenities are built for people in the way they want them, that provide the type of recreation and transportation opportunities that they need, that's the clear way to do that. Um, in San Francisco, in the mission, Latino activists rallied to try and stop bike lanes because they thought that the bike lanes were just going to be used by young tech workers on their $1,500 fixed gear bikes and that that was not really what they needed in their neighborhood. Long Beach, many years ago, uh, a group of Latino mothers took over the planning process for um, bike lanes and they rerouted the bike lanes so the bike lanes became safe routes to school instead of ways to connect the hotel to the convention center. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of possibility mm -hmm. for taking over those planning yeah. processes in ways that works for the yeah. community. Yeah, no, I, w I would completely echo Robert's point. I mean, I don't, I mean, improvements of open spaces are good for the people that live there, right? The, the questions are, you know, who are gonna be those people? Um, and, you know, and that's when, when Robert's point about sort of involving the community, yes, right? Like, obviously, you, you do kind of, um, you know, uh, community planning and community needs assessments and, um, and, and, you know, but you also have to get at, well, how do you make sure that the housing stock around there doesn't sort of appreciate in price in a way that displaces that community and it becomes an amenity that, that you know, and then you have to, intervene much more directly in, in sort of how the housing mark op market operates in ways that, that, that protect low-income people so that improvements don't mean that they have to be displaced because that, I mean, you know, it's crap to have the, 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 the and I'm sorry, that's an academic term, um, to have the choice be, um, you know, uh, public spaces that nobody wants to be in um, or displacement when the public space becomes attractive enough that it be, begins to drive further rent increases that they can no longer afford to, to be there. That, that, that's not a choice that planners um, or anyone else who cares about cities um, should be willing to make. All right, let's go to another question from our audience. Lots of questions coming in. Uh, we often speak exclusively about residential displacement, but what tools do we have to combat commercial displacement as a function of preserving local culture? All right. Huh. Um, do you want to go for it? Uh, you, 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 okay. Um, 
Well, I mean, I'm re reminded of sort of the, uh, was it was Ruth Messinger who used to go on about commercial rent uh, uh, stabilization. Um, we've, we've never done that as far, I mean, certainly not in my lifetime, which is getting longer. Um, and, but, but there are ways for sure to intervene um, to protect commercial space. Uh, I've spent a lot of time the last couple of years in, in uh, Minneapolis St. Paul, which is odd for me, but that, that it's a lovely place to visit in the summer. But, um, and, and in St. Paul, they have, uh, the black community was displaced um, when they plowed the highway through in the 50s, as you know, that's where you put the highway. But, um, but uh, now is facing displacement pressures um, as Whole Foods has moved in and, and the hipster food co-op has moved in. Um, and, um, and the black communities organized a, a retail community land trust um, that's actually going to be a mixed uh, use uh, community uh, community land trust owning the land um, and then uh, ground floor retail and senior housing above um, as a way to kind of preserve black uh, small business ownership in the face of displacement. Um, you know, you look at Mott Haven in, in, in the South Bronx, um, they, uh, there's a community land trust that's been established to um, to have community ownership of the land and to do a, a mixed commercial um, community space, including light industrial with a kind of in, a large industrial kitchen as part of it, um, to kind of preserve the kind of commercial character um, of the area and make sure that the development that's occurring um, in the South Bronx doesn't displace um, those that are there. Yeah, so that, that sort of mass land ownership, either in the form of a community land trust or a community development corporation that right. owns large blocks, that, that's really the way to do it. That, Okay, now, so let's just define this for people who are still unclear. What is a community land trust? How does it work? Uh, a, C, uh, a CLT, community land trust, is uh, a situation where the land is owned um, by a not-for-profit entity, uh, and the improvements on the land are owned by some other entity, whether it be individual homeowner that owns the house um, or um, a corporation that has a multifamily rental property, not-for-profit corporation, or, or even a for-profit, um, or a commercial space, or you know, no, no improvements on the land if you're doing it as a community garden, um, which is an improvement on the land, but it's not a built-form improvement on the land. Um, you know, I mean, in, in some ways, it's, it, it was um, basically black power um, organizers in, in Albany, Georgia in, in 68, grabbing onto Henry George and Ebenezer Howard and, um, and creating this, uh, this form of community control. Um, and can we quantify, I mean, how much land or how, how do you quantify the success right. of, the, of the CLT? Um, well, there are about now 280 CLTs operating in the United States, um, including a, a few here in New York. Um, where are they in New York? Uh, well, there's Cooper Square that's been there for a number of decades now. Um, and, uh, and now two new ones, um, one in East Harlem, El Barrio, the, the East Harlem, El Barrio CLT, um, and one in Mott Haven um, in, um, in the South Bronx. Um, and, you know, it's a fairly small form of, of intervention at this point it, because it is a little bit clunky to work with and because the subsidies are, are it's so upfront subsidy heavy um, to acquire the land, but then once you've done that, you don't have to resubsidize it, right? Like it's not like, um, you know, a Section 8 contract that, um, that a landlord gets that every 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, you have to bribe the landlord um, with increasing um, payments to get them to stay in the affordable housing program. And Robert, is this something that's taking off in Oakland or the surroundings? There are a number of community land trusts in Oakland. Um, people have looked at them over the last couple decades uh, more with an eye on stabilizing communities in place. Right. And I would say that there, again, given the small number and the relatively small size, for stabilizing residential communities, it's been less of a successful model than maybe for right. commercial. Mm. Right. Um, and you know, what we look at in, in Oakland is, um, Oakland is an interesting hybrid. Um, the Bay Area, unlike here, which is dominated by one huge city, we don't have that. And 
Uh, people compare Oakland to Brooklyn a lot, but that's as if Brooklyn was a different city with a different administration. And we have large parts of town that still are not seeing much market rate development. Mm -hmm. It was big news a couple of months ago when a market rate developer wanted to build 60 units and he's moving forward and doing that in East Oakland because that was the first one in forever. And so what people are really trying to figure out is how to incentivize the market because that's where the real development happens. That's where the real numbers can happen to, to you know, potentially make an impact in the supply demand equation that's out of whack right now. Let me take another question from the audience here. <clears throat> All right, so this questioner wants you to pick out of four options for rent control, wants you to pick two. <laughs> oh, with what criteria? Is this your yeah. own. Yeah, our own, property? okay. Okay, so let's, what are the options? <laughs> so pick two, number one, minimal displacement. Two, no more super talls. Number three, keep over 20% of New York City landmark. Four, preserve all existing forms of rent control. It depends on what your goal is. Um, <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so, so the thing about rent control often, the, the critics will say, okay, well, this is a way of preserving those who are here and those who have a place and helping them maintain what they have but it's not very helpful for newcomers who might be moving in, and it could potentially have a negative impact on supply. So I don't know if I'm gonna be boxed into picking an answer there because yeah. it depends on, on, on what your vision is of the future and what it is you're trying to, right. to achieve. So you have a fifth option you wanna to present to the crowd? None of the above. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Some of the above depending, that's the sixth option. Uh-huh. Um, so, I don't know what yeah. you want to say, James. Um, I mean, I, my, my relationship with rent stabilization, I mean, and, and people in this audience should know, but, but if you don't, I mean, the kind of, you know, the rent controlled part of the housing stock in New York is tiny. Um, you know, the rent stabilized part of the housing stock in New York is fairly robust, and we're at about, what, 1.1 million or so units in, in rent stabilization, but we're only at about 35,000 units that are rent controlled. So in a city of, what, 8.4 million people, the 35,000 units in rent control are nothing. Um, and, and, um, but it's a rent regulated stock, the rent stabilized stock. Um, I mean, if you look at who's in those units, um, and you go with the, the city's housing vacancy survey or some of the work that Ingrid um, has done over the years, and you just saw Ingrid um, uh, just a minute ago, I think, sitting here. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a working class population. Um, I mean, last time I camped out with the HVS, with the Housing Vacancy Survey, I mean, we were looking at median household income about 26, 27. Um, you know, I, I mean, this is not a, a, a wealthy part of the city's population. And absent other kinds of interventions, um, to have an, the housing stock be more affordable to working people, um, I, don't, I don't see how you would sort of get rid of it and not have very significant displacement, given, given the income levels that, that we're talking about, um, you know, for rent stabilization, uh, you know, in, you know in, in the aggregate. Rather than rezone low-income neighborhoods, shouldn't the mayor's housing plan also seek to rezone high-income areas? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Without any yes 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 I mean you know where's all right I, I mean I, you know there was a, a a classic back and forth um, you know one of the housing activists was really pushing for an upzoning um, uh, in Forest Hills um, and, and I'm a Queens kid I grew up in Flushing and um, and Forest Hills is always sort of like the posh um, part of of uh, Eastern Queens um, and. Um, and the city's response was that the pushback would be, be too strong there. That's, that's a problem everywhere. Uh, um, but, yeah, problem uh, everywhere. Where uh, I am, uh, there is, in San Francisco, uh, development going on in the Mission, development going on in Bayview, the Latino mm -hmm. and the black neighborhood. In Oakland, you have development going on in West Oakland and in Fruitvale, but in the well-to-do neighborhoods, no developers crazy enough to try to waste their time right. um, dealing with the community opposition. Right. And that is a big problem. Right. We need to broaden the geography of where the infill development can happen. Right. You know, and, 
and, and then it really does get at, again, I mean, what I said earlier, right? The, the, the issues are less about sort of, you know, neighborhood change and more about sort of what are the values that are going to, you know, drive how we make the city. Um, and, and what are... <sighs> What are the what are the roles that that, that uneven or unequal power relations are going to play in in that process, right? To watch up zonings um, in East New York or in East Harlem or in Jerome Avenue, um, you know, sort of move forward um, very often in the face of very aggressive resistance in the community, um, um, and not have and have the city basically throw up its hands before it gets even begins the conversation in, in wealthier areas is kind of infuriating, to be honest. All right, I think this is the last question we can um, raise before our time's up. Um, and I'm not sure if this, I'm supposed to register this with some sort of glee or zeal, but it's what will displace hipsters? <laughs> Ow! Yeah, they, yeah that, they'll get older. Right. They'll age they'll out. They'll get and... older, they'll get married, they will. <laughs> They'll put on to, weight. They'll do all those sorts they'll of things. They'll move to Montclair. Clip out of their um, skinny jeans. Move, yeah. And yeah. Move on. Well, I mean, we've done this before, right? I mean, I remember when I was a grad student um, in the latter part of the 90s reading an old article um, from an, an architectural critic named Rosalind Deutsch called The Fine Art of Gentrification, um, which Deutsch had published in 83, I want to say, on, um, on these processes. I mean, what will happen, right, is that, um, I mean, Genuine artists don't earn anything, right? Because we're not a society that values the making of art for its own sake, and they'll just get displaced. Um, and so, um, you know, because they will set off uh, the forces that will lead to rent increases that they no longer can afford. Um, and so we've seen this movie before. They'll, yeah. The hipsters that really are kind of, uh, you know, creative, uh, to use that sort of godforsaken um, language, uh, you know, they will, they will be displaced because they, they're not making enough money. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but the economy will not stay strong forever. Right. There will be a downturn. Uh, there will be a technology bust. Uh, people will get laid off, and then we'll have other problems that seem equally severe, if not more severe, that we'll be talking about. Well, on that promising note. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you, James. Thank you.